for your it's uh the big band master class at 9 a.m right yep yep awesome looking forward to it thank you all right well we're supposed to talk about recording here and since all of us record that would be a good thing to do stockton has how many releases did you put out on your label you're muted at the, at the moment yeah we uh I mean, yeah, I have a little independent label called Armored Records that <clears throat> I actually started in 2006, uh, right after uh, Maynard Ferguson passed and I got <clears throat> off the road with him. Um, I had a new record I wanted to put out, and I was kind of doing the thing that I'm sure we all know the feeling of, which is you're sending your record to every record label you can think of, hoping someone will assist you in putting it out. Uh, most importantly, financial assistance would be nice, and no one wants to do that, especially... Uh, when you're a young, no-name person like I was, and am. Uh, and so I uh, did a bunch of research and was like, well, why don't I start my own little label? I had some friends uh, all over the country, different places that I had met and worked with who were putting out independent releases. And I just had the notion of why don't we just try to do something cooperatively so that if one of our records gets anything positive, We'll have the same label, like not a record label, but literal label on the record. So maybe we can build some sort of synergy there. And it really was kind of a hobby, and I learned a lot doing it. And uh, you know, as the old uh, joke goes, how do you, how does a jazz musician make a million dollars? They start with two million dollars. I definitely, you, you know, wasted a lot of money experimenting and hiring various forms of independent rep- representation for my record and working with people on my label to help them. And it was really a co-op where uh, we didn't really exchange any monetary value, but at the time, the thing that I had a lot of was sweat equity. I I was trying to reestablish myself in the Dallas-Fort Worth area work-wise, and I was trying to get my name out there. And It was a great way to network with people if they had a record I dug, trying to help them put it out. So we have, I think now we have close to 70 releases, um, and I'm really proud that I... Over half the people whose records we've put out, I, I don't have a personal friendship with. I have an acquaintance with maybe and met through that. And they're um, cats from everywhere, from you know New York to, to Texas to Chicago to Los Angeles, just through word of mouth and contacts. Uh, and honestly, I've, I've been a bit naughty, and I haven't been investing a lot of time in it the last few years because um, we had kids, and that has uh, taken up a lot of my free time, which is wonderful. But I learned a lot, and it's... The person who benefited the most from it, honestly, was me from an educational standpoint, um, and, and it was, it's been a great, it's been a lot of fun. Um, I'm a little more picky now when people hit me up to help them release stuff just because I, I don't have as much time, but I yeah. certainly learned a lot of valuable lessons from it. Well, the big question is, do you release anything now? What form does you release it in, and how does it work? You know? That is a great question. Um, yes, we do still release things, but some of our artists will do digital only. Some will do a mixture of things. People are starting to want to put out vinyl, uh, small presses of vinyl, because there's some audiophiles who are starting to want to collect vinyl. If I remember correctly, uh, was it 2019 or 2020 was the first year that vinyl outsold CDs? Really? As far as market share. Total sales? Yeah, total sales. Crazy. Um, I know for 90% my reason, of those vinyls were digitally recorded. So they're not. Right. Oh, oh, the irony. Yeah, we, yeah. Start, with, we start with cats having to be repositioned in a room as they're playing into a cone. You know, we're having to move Louis Armstrong to the far corner because he's too, he's overblowing Joe Oliver. And right. now, yeah, we're recording it in Pro Tools and printing it on vinyl. Well, it's just it's very, mm-hmm. very human of us. What a great human thing we've done. Uh, but uh, I did, I don't know about you gentlemen, I'm sure all of you have great feedback on this. I know for my recent record, I only printed a very small amount of hard copy albums and kind of tried to use that as a selling point, And I'm pleased that I sold them out and I certainly won't print more of them because... Um, you mean CDs? Yes, I printed, I think I did 100 copies. Yeah. And I sold them. And people seem to like the limited edition of it. And I like the fact that I don't have a 1,000 sitting in my storage closet that I'm going to throw out in 10 years. Um, yeah. But it's, you know, I think that's a very great question is what is the format? And the more dangerous question for me is how do we monetize our art? How do you monetize any of that? Well, because of the pandemic, we're starting to be expected to pr- produce extremely high quality content like we always have, but we should give it to everyone for free. And maybe in the kindness of their heart, they'll donate to uh, you know, a little app link that we yeah. have. And I, I think that 
whenever people start getting something for free, to ask them to start paying premium price for it again is nearly impossible. Yeah. Stockton, can I, I just jump in because I'm liable to forget to ask this of you later. The 100 CDs, do you actually like number them and sign them? Do you make it like this is a limited edition, this kind of thing? I have friends who have done that. Um, I guess I'm too lazy to do that. I just, <laughs> I just told people, hey, I have 100 copies, get them while they're hot. Um, and then I did not number them, but I did, uh, I did sign every one of them. If people would, I said, if you would like them personalized, I'll do it. And then we know that it's completely devoid of value because I've signed it, but I did do that. And I think people dug that, you know, I had a lot of people who would buy it for, you know, like maybe someone else say, Hey, could you personalize it for this person? And I was like, sure. Yeah. I mean, we've already hit rock bottom. So I'll put my signature on it. I'm sure you, other people on this call know more than I do about this. And I can't remember the name of the rock group. But, but but the rock group that had like a single copy and sold it for thousands of, who was that? That was Wu-Tang Clan. Okay. Wu-Tang yeah. Clan did that. Yeah. They sold it for like a million bucks. Yeah. Well, I, Martin have, Atkins, I have an album available for a million dollars if anyone yeah, has. That's my joke. Every gig I say uh, the records are a thousand bucks a piece, but they only have to sell one. <laughs> so yeah. Martin Atkins is a punk rock drummer that played with Sid Vicious and Johnny Rotten and all these people. And he's like one of the original punkers, do-it-yourself guys. He does posters, flyers, bat he sells pieces of this curtain behind the band. He cuts it up and puts it in a frame and sells that. He does these box sets. He does scratch and sniff records. He does uh, anything you can think of that he does, uh, you know, to, set, to make it an interesting and original piece. Because he says the only people that are really interested in you are the people that are interested in you. So why not go all the way and give them some piece of you that no one else can have because it's not a mass market thing, especially for us playing jazz, you know, the kind of jazz each of us plays, you could even put our, you know, in a broad umbrella, of course, but even in smaller umbrellas and how many people are interested in that, you know? So, yeah, Jay, you were, you've been doing a lot of New York people and I know they have a different attitude probably as far as recording. You know, because a lot of people you do are, are uh, they don't come to Stockton with the finished product and say, could you help me put this out or, or whatever. They, they come to you and say, we want to record in your studio. What are they looking to do? I noticed you just put out Ronnie Cuber and Gary Smalley in record, right? Well, that was actually uh, Steeplechase. So I, Steeplechase? I, I don't, uh, I'm different from Stockton. I'm a, very, I find it very interesting listening to him talk about it. I really know, I'm embarrassed to say very little about that. You know, what I, um, what I do at my place is more, I, you know, I have the benefit of a space that I can record in, you know, so I bought, I haven't spent tens of thousands of dollars, but what I have found, if you have good musicians and deeper, de decent microphones and a good space, uh, that's enough, you know, to make a great record, you know. Um, so I, I don't put out, I, I'm not a record company, you know, I just have, uh, and it's not, it's basically my friends, you know, I, I somebody will say, oh, I want to do something. If I don't know them, I don't really do it, you know. I, I play on 90% of it, and it's music I want to play, you know, and sometimes a former student or something, I'll just say, yeah, come you come up and do them a solid and don't, don't even charge them, just, you know, the joy of making music together, you know, so um, I'm not a good example, you know, although I, I do play, as I mentioned in our last meeting with Maria Schneider, and she's kind of a, um, an innovator in the, uh, the record, I think she was the first artist of any genre to win a Grammy for his self-produced non-major label recording. And, um, you know, she works her ass off at making that happen with Artist Share. And she's actually, uh, maybe eight years ago, she testified, it looked like a, it looked like a Watergate hearing. Yeah, I saw she, her, yeah. <laughs> yeah, she testified in front of Congress and she got a, had to deal with, most of them were sympathetic, but some real pricks, you know, well, if I want to put my, sorry for the southern, bad southern accent, but, 
you know, if I have a video on YouTube and I want to put your music to it, you're saying I got to pay you? And she was like, yes, exactly, you know. <laughs> and you can do that at mariaschneider.com. And uh, sitting next to the people from Google. And, uh, and you know, she calls it playing whack-a-mole. You know, she's trying to keep her music off the internet, you know, uh, so, it, so people can't steal it. So uh, she spends... The, the lion's share of her time chasing people that are posting her stuff on the internet. And then the, then they make her look like the bad guy. You know, the, the music is taken off and there's a little icon with a slash to it and says, uh, this artist has refused to, I forget what it says, but it, it has kind of a negative connotation, like she's the bad guy, you know? And uh, so on the one hand, it seems futile but i think and i don't know if stockton or any of you would agree i mean i <laughs> harold we have a record coming out soon right uh you're uh yeah we have right, uh, right, right of spring yeah we got our spring garden uh the seeds of igor shavinsky uh uh trying to get ambitious and uh uh and steal <laughs> steal stuff from the right of spring my favorite song uh <laughs> And uh, yeah, so I, I've been uh, since 1990 or something recording for Steeplechase. And uh, uh, Jay's done what, 100? You were, that was the 100th record you did? Yeah, your record was the 100th Steeplechase record. Yeah, oh I, I've done maybe about 30 between a side man. And, and you know, what I look at is uh, Niels Winter has managed to document my, uh, uh, my adult life or uh, if in my darker times, I, I could say document my decline. <laughs> but but, <laughs> but anyway, hair. we talked about that earlier. So, yeah. <laughs> but I don't know you all think, you know, it's like, why do we record, you know, and, may, and maybe as recently as 15 years ago, maybe one could make some bread, you know, um, from sales or publishing or whatever. And it's, this isn't a good thing, but at this point, it's basically become to document your music. Right. And that's an, a very important thing. You know, you're not going to pay your mortgage with that. But, you know, me, you know. That's what, the, that's what Rufus Reed told me. I've talked to him at the Composers Arrangers Conference last year. And he said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm still putting out records nobody wants to buy or listen to. <laughs> and he said, yes, but your family needs you to document your music and you should do that. Yeah, I think that's very important, you know. Um, so, and really, I mean, Harold, I'm looking at maybe not Jesus, but most of that, or Stockton, we're old enough to have you know, recorded where you get the contract and all oh, the publishing deal sucks and blah, 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 and how much, but even in those days, I don't think jazz musicians, you know, there, there were flukes along the way. Somebody had something on a record and some uh, person that looks for music to put on in the background of movies likes your, likes it and puts it, uh, puts it there or, uh, and some money can be made. So you don't want to give everything away on the one hand, but on the other hand, I would, I, I don't know what the percentages are stock that maybe you know, or somebody else knows, but uh, uh, I don't think people were making a ton from the publishing of their, their tunes, you know. No, I don't think so. I, I agree with you, Jay. I think that we've entered a, a, and have been there for a number of years, we're making a recording, especially a jazz recording is not something we're doing to profit solely off the recording. I think we can justify uh, some other maybe, you know, profitable things that could come from it. Uh, it's all, you know, similar to why people who do nothing like the Kardashians are in the news all the time. It's because if you're in the news every news cycle, people will take an interest in what you do. And if for nothing else, having a new album out every so often is a reason for people hopefully to talk about you again and hopefully talk about you positively so that you could make your way to perhaps someone who is booking for a venue. My wife manages a performing arts center uh, here in the Dallas area, so I hear her talk from the completely other side of it. And when, when people are popping up, you know, if a name pops up often enough, they'll take a curiosity on it and we'll contact to try to book that artist. And so for me, uh, for years now, I've gone into it 
expecting not to profit from the recording itself, but hoping that my career can benefit from it in other ways. And I, I believe it has. But you're exactly right. Um, I think from, from the standpoint of hoping to profit off of the licensing of music, that's now become such a separate part of the industry. I have some friends who sit in small little home studios and make essentially library music to be sold for television, radio, and commercials. And every once in a while, I'll go play recording sessions for them, and I'll sign a waiver that I, you know, I'm, I get no rights to anything, and I get paid one up upfront fee. And then, like the other day, I'll hear myself playing brushes behind Jerry Seinfeld on a Netflix special, just stuff like that. And so here he's making millions, and I'm like, hey, I think I get made a hundred bucks for that. Um, but I guess I don't know. Don't hate the player, hate the game, kind of thing. Um, and it's been kind of like that for me when I reached a point where I was at least semi-talented enough to start to do work in studios. Um, and the, the thing I'd love to hear some of you give your, your ideas about is how much, um, just historically, especially in jazz, the process of recording has changed. And I think young people have no idea what that means. I think that like my college students, my North Texas students, um, playing music in a recording studio means everyone is in an isolation booth, everyone has headphones in their ears, and they have a very sophisticated device beside them to mix their sound to be exactly what they want to be, and that's how they're going to go about it, and there's probably going to be a click track going on as well, where for me, some of the albums I cherish the most are recorded back in the 40s and 50s, and all of them are gathered in a very, they're clustered in a small room, and especially with drummers, I mean, Max Roach had to play softly, or else he's going to bleed into every other, you know, he's bleeding into the piano mic, he's bleeding into the bass mic. And those stories of Paul Chambers going to Van Gelder's on Sundays just so they could experiment with how to mic his bass and not get bleed. Um, and I think that that's an important aspect of recording that's been lost in recent years. And students don't even know it's lost because they don't know it ever existed. So, Jay, when you're doing a lot of recording, are you isolating everyone and, and playing with headphones? Or do you try to do as much acoustically in a room as possible? Uh, well, everybody's different, you know, personally, I actually don't, for recording, you know, playing live, of course, there's not, we were touching on it earlier when Mike was talking, you know, there's nothing like playing with real <laughs> warm bodies in a room together, hopefully for an audience, you know, th there's nothing that can replace that. But having said that, uh, when I record, I kind of like being isolated, you know, uh, the, the, what, what happens is, especially as a bass player, everything ends up going into your mic. And when you, they raise the bass mic, they're starting to hear more of vibes kind of in the distance. Why does it sound weird? Well, that's because the vibes are going through the bass mic. Okay. Well, let's turn the bass mic down or let's use more of the DI. So there's this cascading effect. So I don't mind being isolated. I've been doing it a long time. And I find at my home here, uh, the guy used to have his taxidermy studio in, in what is now my studio. So it's a separate room and I do have isolation. And um, and it's, I, I kind of prefer it. I'm not a, an expert at uh, engineer, but I do have the benefit of, uh, experience and like i said before if you have great players and decent stuff i remember doing a uh, i used to play with joe sample piano player and we I flew out to la we're going to do this record and al schmidt was the recording engineer al schmidt has more grammys i, I think eugene ormandy and michael michael jackson have as many grammys as al schmidt i think he has 20 grammys and i was kind of intimidated and he did have me in the same room a few feet from Joe. And I was like, so Al, where, where, where do you want me to stand? And he was like, in front of the microphone, you know? And, and I, you know, it does make a difference, proximity effect or whatever. It does make a difference where you stand, but really, you know, I think it becomes a little precious also. And, you know, I, I don't know how many records Harold and I have done together. Um, and it's been isolated, you know, we're in isolation, but the music is always beautiful. And then when we play a live gig, it's beautiful. And uh, um, the only thing I do want to say about the current state of affairs, you know, uh, recording at home, I've been doing a lot of uh, 
recording here by myself. And I try to embrace it, you know, with my ensemble at a school I teach at. Um, we every week we do a different tune, everybody mails in their parts. Da -da -da -da. Is that is that optimal? Not at all. But is there something to be gained from that? Yeah, you know, when you play music, you have to play with the other people, but you also have to have your own course of action or whatever you want, your, your own tack. You know, you almost have to have your own strength as, a, as an individual player. So there is something to be gained from that. So I try to uh, let them learn something in that process that I think is beneficial. Pandemic aside, this is where the music is kind of going anyway, for better or worse, you know? So it's, it's not a great thing, but it's a thing and you have to deal with it, you know? So I tell my friends who are my age, who are totally against it, I'm like, well, man, you gotta, you know, and it doesn't mean it has to be, you know, with a click track, you know, I've played free music. I did, uh, and Harold, uh, Gary Dial and I just did a duo record. He's in St. John. He's in St. John and he's using Logic and the piano sound in Logic, which is pretty good. And I'm here in upstate New York. He's in the sun. I'm freezing my ass off. And it's taken us four months to do it with our schedules <laughs> and, you know, people, friends dying and everything else, you know, that's going on. Um, and it's, it's a beautiful fucking record, you know, wow. we're really proud of it. And it's a lot of it's rubato and, you know, the process is different, but the, you know, the end, I, if Glenn Gould can hack up the Goldberg variations and make it sound good, you know, the end justifies the means, you know, and, uh, we're not hacking it up too much, but it, it requires some planning, you know, and it's not like playing together, but it's, it's different, but man, it, it was a very rewarding experience. You know, no, the, re the, the recording process is a different process from playing live, but I like to keep as much of the live uh, element in, in what I do, but there's times when there's a mistake, you know, and so we've, we've added, you know, we've edited and, I, I had the, the great uh, honor of uh, playing on a lot of Tio Macero dates that he did for himself. He was a crazy man, but <laughs> boy, he was a splicer in the, in the days of splicing and, and he kept up with it. And uh, I, we would go in and, and it would be a different product by the time it was done. And it was, uh, you know, he doesn't get a lot of credit sometimes for as creative as he was. And he saved miles as he would, always say he saved a lot of Miles Davis stuff and then uh, Miles you know they, they had a funny relationship at times but uh, but I I learned what you know a few things uh, more than a few things although I don't I couldn't do them uh, out of what what his process was he wanted it really spontaneous and then he said I'll take care of it later I remember once when I over prepared for like a monk tribute record when I finally got to Eastman, because I used to do TO records and go in and feel like, oh God, I, I, I you know, <laughs> I just, just kind of keeping, trying to keep there. And he would make something of it, you know, ducking me out of certain things. I think one time he brought Lou Soloff in to record a trumpet solo over my solo because I didn't play <laughs> enough. But that was his, you know, that it, it sounded great. And Lou Soloff, who, uh, it was the first time he came up to me after that and he said, hey, hey, man, he knew who I was finally after I'd met him about 15 times, but he remembered who I was because he played a solo during my solo. <laughs> <as an overdub. laughs> so, so, so anyway, but it is, a, you know, like the more it can be for jazz uh, spontaneous, I, I think the better it gets that flavor. And I, I've been lucky to be on a lot of live records like you know some stuff with Chet Baker and whatever uh, that are the best you know that that I can that I can remember playing at that time like a couple of live things with Thad and Mel that were just you know I mean that's as good as I can play <laughs> yeah that quartet recording from Miami or Fort Lauderdale yeah there's one there's a quartet record from Miami yeah and it captures that moment and you know maybe it's not perfect but you know it, it uh, everyone, uh, you know, Rufus saved me and <laughs> Mel saved me and, and uh, whatever. So, you know, that's, that's what, that's what it's about. Yeah. 
I'll shut up. I, I have to, I, I smell dinner. No, oh, you that... bastard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. I smell it too. I smell it too. Is it, uh, what is it? <laughs> Anyway, good to kind of meet you All guys. Right. I hope to hope yeah. one of these days we can actually be in the same room. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? Jay, right, I'll, I'll, I'll see, you see you tomorrow. Okay. So as far as hey Glenn, oh, that reminded me since we're talking about Tio. Um, yeah. When we were doing Maynard's last record, so we recorded Maynard's last record at uh, Bennett Studios. Um, and we recorded it four weeks before Maynard passed. And I, I was tasked with producing that, which was terrifying. And I remember that we, uh, we had a couple days where we were doing some, some overdubbing and fixing some solos for Maynard. <clears throat> and there was this moment where I was sitting with, just him and I were sitting at the board, the engineer had stepped out for a moment. And out of the blue, Maynard was like, you know, everyone tells me that my, their favorite record I ever made was my record Live at Jimmy's. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's the one. Everyone loves that record. I love it too. And he goes, you want to know something about that record? And I was like, yes, absolutely. And he was like, well, <clears throat> it was a bunch of cats who were heavy drinkers in the band. And they got totally wasted every night during that. We recorded for a couple nights. And the trumpet parts were unusable. They were so bad <laughs> that you, you couldn't use them. And so Tio had me come in. And I overdubbed all the trumpet parts on a different trumpet for every one of them. And it made perfect sense to me because when you listen to that famous recording of MacArthur Park, there's like a shout chorus thing. And it's like, man, this lead trumpet player sounds so much like Maynard. And then Maynard comes in playing the solo part. And it is. It's five Maynards. And Tio was the one who pieced that all together. So Maynard's most famous record. Oh, well, that's a good story. Yeah. I haven't told that story many times. I feel kind of dirty when I tell it. But, you know. <laughs> Austin Marlowe, what are you up to, man? What do you play? Uh, hi, I play trombone. Um, I'm in the Dallas Fort Worth area. I actually go to TCU. Oh, okay. Um, I'm actually I'm student teaching right now at a high school, and Stockton was just at the school last week, um, doing oh. a little presentation. So, all right, good deal, good deal. I've said the exact what same stuff. What about you? So you often me? pretend like you never. You up to? What, what are you doing? You me? Talk to me. She plays soprano sax, I guess. Or, or she conga. Holds it. She's leaning on a conga, so maybe maybe she strikes that conga with the soprano saxophone. Oh no. <laughs> the new thing. Well, um, yeah, and then regardless of how you record, this the question is how do you get stuff out anymore? Um, and then music is free, so how do you deal with that? Glenn, I can speak to it to that just a touch um i was fortunate enough to well i have two records in the can and i have another one that's already out um i call them records still i don't know they are uh, records i guess they are <laughs> anyway I was the record of your playing that day i was fortunate enough to um be able to record in a in a really good studio that was built because Tommy LaPuma, the famous record guy, you know, gave him like uh, $12 million to build a studio up in Cleveland. So the studio is like completely laid out. It's great. So I got, you know, we got everything done. We got the, you know, the first recording done. We got it, sent it to Nashville, got it mastered, the whole deal. Um, and my partner and I were talking about, man, what are we going to do? You know, it's like that, that same question that came up earlier. You know, I'm trying to shop it to this label and that label and the other label. And all oh, my friends, my friends getting records out on this thing. And I know this guy over here. And, oh, we have a connection to this place and, a, you know, a connection to that place. You know, it's hard to even get anybody to respond to an email. You know, you guys yep. know this. Um, it's hard to get so people to even listen to it when you give it to them you know right I mean even for a review I mean you know fortunately I had a couple people that would and 
I was lucky. Um, but as it turns out, the, the person who runs the recording program up at uh, Cuyahoga Community College, he has his own label. And he says, oh, he says, I can take care of this for you. And, you know, I, I ask around to lots of different people, you know, what should I do? How much product should I, you know, have in hand to make? You know, what about the internet? What do I do? How do I get it on all these places? Well, you know, this guy pretty much had all the answers for that. Um, I only ordered 100 CDs. Um, they made a mistake on the covers. So I made the, the company that made the mistake on the covers do them over. And they let me keep the first 100. So I had 200. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Double the profit. Yeah. So, I, you know, I have about 20 left, but I give them away. You know, it's a business card. Right. Or I send it to a festival or I send it to somebody to review it. Um, and, you know, it's a document, as you say. But uh, this guy, David Kennedy, who has Tighten Up Records, that's the name of it. And he's got a, you know, there's different kinds of bands on his label. I mean, there's a few of us that are jazz musicians. And then there's some blues bands and there's some pop kind of artists and stuff. Um, but he... He has a thing, I don't know exactly how all of it works, where like I pay him just a, a certain fee and it's not even ridiculous money. And he he takes care of this. He says, Oh, I'll take I'll take care of putting everything on, on the internet for you. I said, Where's it going? And so he started making a list of me for me of all the sites where it was going to be available. And he says, you know, and there's dozens of more of these sites that it's going to be on all over the world. I'm like, okay. I go, what happens now? I, I said, you know, I'm pay, giving you money. And yeah, the thing's going to be out. And maybe somebody will hear it, which is good. So then, as it turns out, you know, he calls me up, you know, because I got a three-year lease with him to put the stuff out onto, you know, anything you can think of. Spotify. Digital TV, distribution. Yeah. Anything. Mm -hmm. it's everywhere so he calls me up after about a year and a half i was like wow i wonder what he wants he says hey cat he says uh you have money coming in do you want it i said what are you talking about he says yeah you, you know from your from your plays for how many plays you get on the internet i go you're kidding i couldn't believe it really you know as it turns out, over the three-year lease, I made about $60. But I was like, well, okay. I, At this point in my life, I mean, I'm not depending on that recording to make, make a living or to pay bills or anything like that. But enough people are listening to it now that actually it's kicking back a few, few pennies compared to what I, what I spent to make it. You know, and at first I didn't want to do the internet distribution thing. I'm like, man, I don't want to give away my money or, you know, give away my rights, my money, my, you know, it's, it, it's not fair what they do to people. You know, it's not, it's not right that they treat musicians like this and you don't, you know, it, it just bothers me. But at the same time, it's like, well, do you want somebody to hear it or not? Because it, you know, for those of you who are working in education and I mean, if you talk to your students, my students do not own one CD. They don't have a CD player. They've never seen a record player. Um, they don't have one CD. I'm like, what do you mean? This was a couple of years ago. I'm like, what are you talking about? What do you do? I go, you don't have the stuff that you love the most and have a copy of it at your house? You're like, no. So it's not something that the people in this current generation can even relate to. And I know that probably most of us can't relate to where they are in that way. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I still have a big room full of records and CDs. And I know. What do I do with them? Kent, I was trying to give them to Youngstown State, like a started library or something. 
What do I do with them? I have like 700 LPs, jazz LPs. Yeah. <laughs> and I have at least that many or more. Yeah. Yeah. Eric was asking about radio sales and I don't know what the situation with radio is. I have a lot of a big mailing list of all the radio stations that play some amount of jazz during the week, but it never seems to lead to any kind of sales or any kind of streaming. Uh, I'm not sure what the point of it is. Unless you yeah. have a gig in Seattle, then the Seattle radio station would play your record before you go to Seattle, right? Well, I've, I've tried playing that game pretty hard before. Um, this was a number of years ago, but what I decided to do after doing some research is I decided I would hire a promotional company for three consecutive releases that I was going, going to do over the course of three or four years, and I was going to try to pay for their, save up and pay for their maximum campaign. And then I, I tracked where, when it got airplay or when it charted, the area, and then I, you know, cross-referenced it with album sales. And I, I personally never saw a correlation at all. And ironic, I also never saw any rhyme or reason to what regions of the United States certain records would get spun more than others. And when I was really kind of distraught and just kind of wanting to finish out my goal, I put a record out that I thought I hurried the most and I didn't like the final result the most. And that stupid thing did the best, and I got the most spins, and I sold the most copies. Uh, and I, I've honestly, I've quit playing that game because every time I look at the top 10 or 20 charts, I see the same few names every single month, and they're on the same couple labels, and those labels are actually with the same gigantic representation companies that have, um, I don't know how they do it, but they have some sort of agreements with the top area radio stations that can get the most spin and get it charted. So maybe it helps them. As an independent artist, um, I, I have not seen an advantage of doing it. And then at, from an artistic standpoint, it makes me a little insane as well. Because, And I think this is the same thing that young people uh, struggle with, my students struggle with when they, I tell them you need to listen to jazz more. Um, if you go listen to any jazz radio station for the most part, it's just like typing the, cat, the genre jazz into Spotify. So then we have something that's arbitrarily selecting from nearly 100 years of jazz. And I would see playlist reports and it would literally be like Louis Armstrong, Billy Holiday, Take five. my seven four fusion song. Yeah. And then it would be Dizzy Gillespie and then Snarky Puppy and then some person singing a pop tune. I was like, this is insane. So um, you know, I, I've I've decided to funnel the little bit of resources I have to different promotional things in my career. Um, in the albums, just like you said, Glenn and, and Kent's talking about it, I do think it's important to have a record of our art. And it also seems that historically, knowing we're going to make an album, whether we had a record deal or we're doing it ourselves, it gives us a very specific deadline to formulate a body of work. We have to formulate the compositionally a body of work. We have to think about the interrelationship of what the timbres, textures, tempi, and styles are. We're going to, you know, agonize over the personnel. Do I use the same personnel for everything? Am I going to uh, have different ensembles for this? Um, and for me, uh, even though if, if I were like sitting here with my accountant showing them how much I've spent making records in my life, they would be slapping me in the head because it would be nothing but giant red numbers everywhere. I would tell them that I can't even quantify how much I learned from these experiences and how it's made me a better musician because of it. Um, and that's not like a, a sexy financial statement, but artistically, I, I feel that it's just what, what we have to do to continue to grow and learn. Uh, the same way I read about Wayne Shorter, like working his butt off to write all the tunes for Speak No Evil, and he was so thankful to get that session because he had a brand new baby he needed to pay for, so he worked really hard writing the tunes, and that, that record has such a complete feel of, of a body of work to me, uh, that seems to be being lost. So I, I think that even though we're not um, raking it in from from selling that record, um, I sleep really well at night knowing I'm, I'm learning and trying to get better like all of my heroes did. Glenn, can I jump in with just one comment? So Absolutely. I feel like what Stock has said is so true about, you know, the whole thing about the focus it gives you making a record and you know, it's kind of the artistic creation. It's in a way, if you don't do that, well, it's a funny analogy. It's not really like a sculptor who never does a sculpture because of course we're playing live, so we are, but it's, it's a way to crystallize 
at least moments in our creative life. But I, I have a question I want to throw out to you guys because this is a funny dilemma for me. There was a point quite early on with Spotify where a friend of mine that had, you know, that had a little record company told me like, my God, these guys are crooks. Spot, they have all of my stuff that they're releasing there. They didn't ask me permission and they're doing it without paying me. They, they don't have any right to use my stuff. So, so this guy had to spend a lot of effort contacting Spotify and, they, and Spotify's response was, oh, if you don't want us to, to take your music and put it on here, here are these many different forms you have to fill out. So this guy spent all this time. It's like, it's like <laughs> if you don't want me to rob you, if you don't want me to steal your car, you know, you have to go and fill out these forms. Otherwise, I'm taking it. And I thought, these are damn crooks. Like, I don't want to deal with crooks like this. So the result is, I, you know, I can't control things that are on labels like Sunnyside. They, they do whatever they want. I never get any royalty statements. It's all, you know, okay, that, that you know, ship has left the harbor. But like with my own record label, no, I, I don't give it to Spotify. And, and there's one of the tracks from one of the recent records that I put on YouTube. You hear the whole track for free. But no, most of the tracks, if you want to go, you got to buy the record. You can get it on, on you know, iTunes or whatever. I mean, there are ways you can buy it digitally but I'm not just giving it to Spotify. Well, one result of this for me is a whole lot of people, friends of mine, students, they're, they're like, oh, I heard so-and-so on Spotify. And it's some ancient thing from Sunnyside. And anything they don't find on, find on Spotify, it doesn't exist in the universe. They're never looking to see, well, what's the, what have you done lately? Uh, and, and so the whole thing's a dilemma. Some people tell me, man, you're being a fool career-wise, you should get this out for free, every possible way so, so people can hear it and you get the most listeners possible. And in principle, I don't have a problem with that. I just have a problem doing it through people who are making money off of you, like Spotify, not paying you or paying you such a pittance, it's ridiculous, you know, and being crooks. So just curious what you guys think about that, what, what your solution has been. I'm so wealthy above and beyond my music career that I don't ever really think about it. I just uh, go swimming in my money bin like Scrooge McDuck. You know, I, uh, I hear where you're coming from for sure. And, you know, I think that um, I, I have reached the point where I have done as you have been suggested to do. I've just turned, I've, I put it everywhere because I feel like the only chance I have for it to be profitable for me is for someone to hear it and because they hear it, take it, you know, hopefully want to book me for either a live appearance with my band or a guest artist appearance or whatever. Um, and I felt like for a long time it was mainly younger people checking out what I was doing anyway. Um, but I don't like it and it feels dirty. But I, but again, it, for me, it factors in to I have now entered into any making my own album endeavor as expecting no return on that product dollar for dollar. I'm expecting it from other things. Uh, and then it gets real hairy. I do all of my um, royalty collection through a third party, which a lot of people do. So I use an organization called CD Baby. I've actually used them since since they started out. So I've kind of watched them grow and develop into a – now they're just a giant player. Um, so what they do is they automatically – and they ask me. I, I have to approve it all. Um, but I can approve every single digital vendor – and at any time I get a monthly update, I can look exactly who's spinning what where, and I get automatic deposits from them. And it's, it's the strangest feeling to receive an email report, and it'll say, congratulations, here's all the plays you've got. And it'll just be this long list. It's a lot of fun. You're, you're scanning down your email, and you're like, oh my gosh, I am the new Madonna. And then you get to the bottom, and you see how much money you made, and it's like 50 cents, 50 cents! You're like, I, I, I mean, I'm a drummer. I'm not very good at math. I use a count to four and start over. But when I'm like, I just counted more than 50, sp you know, and, and that is disheartening. And, and I get it. And it's a game that if you're a gigantic artist, it makes you a lot of money. Um, and so I guess. Not I even, though. No, that's not even true, though. Some of well, the gigantic artists, they said you have to stream five million streams yeah. to make like 5,000 bucks. I know. So, and I'll tell you what, I mean, who's streaming millions of streams on you? And I know. How is Taylor Swift going to make it, Glenn? You're going to have to well, give her a loan. She's not getting it from streaming.
she's getting it from touring, but I don't know what she's doing now. But like you said, or somebody said, it's all about it's just much of a tangent. But I think I, somebody said it's all about. It's just a, it used to be you had to get all the gigs to make. We, yeah, sure. And now you have to make a bunch of records to get a gig. Yeah. Right. And of course, if you're on Spotify and you're all over the place, Rory, then somebody says, "Well, where can I hear your music?" And you go Spotify, and they already have access to it. Instead of having to go find your record, go to Rory Stewart. Where do I find this cut? That cut. You know what I mean? Yeah, and, and, and by the way, you know, to follow that, if Spotify was a not-for-profit by volunteers who weren't making any money themselves, and they were going to give it to everyone in the world, and there were zero royalties, I'm all in. That's okay. I mean, it's not great because you're not f getting the artist back any kind of money to put into making future records. It's, it's screwed up. But that's 2021. That, that would be fine. It's only the thing where it's like, you know, these guys are driving around in Rolls Royce and they're sending you this thing with, you know, three cents of royalties. Yeah, yeah. but the thing is, your music is getting out there. Where, who's going to hear your music otherwise? Where is it going to be? It's going to be in your house, you know? Well, when it's you're, like expo you're getting exposure, right? And as they always say, yeah, exposure. but you can die from exposure. <laughs> and and by, by the way, just to throw out one other thing um, that's sort of interesting, it's an interesting model. Uh, well, I think of it as the Patreon model, but uh, this friend of mine, it doesn't have to be a secret, Dave, Dave Douglas, a trumpet player friend of mine, you know, Dave Douglas has this thing where you you kind of become a member of his, whatever it is, and, and it costs a little bit of money. And then he's doing all these recordings and stuff and you, you have access to all this stuff. Now, I know that Glenn does this a little bit, except you don't charge anybody, right? You just give everyone stuff for free. But well, it's, I used to, when Nimbit was still going, I had all my stuff on Nimbit, but now Nimbit went out of business, so I got to figure out where to go now. Yeah. But yeah, but it but it's sort of interesting this model because, you know, I think it's hard. You've got to be a a pretty widely known artist to pull this off. But you know, if you can get, right, if, if you can get a certain core of people that really love your stuff and they're willing to pay five dollars a month or something. Okay, but if you've got, you know, enough hundreds of them. Look at Maria with Artist Share, as Jay was saying. I mean, she's, yeah. made a, she's made a career of that. I think what all this really points to, especially for the young people who, uh, even if they're not with us now, I think a lot of your students are going to watch this later, Glenn. I think all of this talk has led to, to one undeniable fact that especially younger musicians who are entering into their professional career need to take into consideration. You cannot 100% focus purely on being a player and hope to have a successful career in our current day and age. Will we ever return to that? I don't know, but it's an undeniable fact, and I think we've seen a lot of evidence through this discussion that you really have to have, quite frankly, a business model for yourself. You need to treat yourself as a business, and is this fun? No, but it's the reality. You need to probably be very disciplined about thinking about what am I doing today or this week that's aimed towards the representation of myself? You know, social media has turned into such a thing that everyone expects a musician to have, and the expectation is constant interacting with it, and it's disposable. So whatever you put up there one day doesn't count for the next day. So there's a, a factor there that can really help generate aspects, you know, as far as opportunities in your career. But you have to maintain it because who can afford to pay someone to do it? When you start getting an income, you can, and there's entities that do that. And then we have this whole thing about where you really need to educate yourself on the current, the current standing of what is able to be expected profit-wise from your music, both digitally or any sort of physical product. Can you profit from it? Or what are your second or third level profit ways of benefiting from it? And so it shows that something that I don't think people ever did is young people, especially college students, you need to take a music business class. And quite frankly, you need to take a regular business class. And you need to make friends with people who are law students and get a real good lawyer friend. Maybe marry one. Marry a lawyer or marry two of them because I think it could help you get a head start. And here's the thing. Oh, by the way, you need to be incredible at your craft. If you're a saxophonist, you need to be incredible. If you're a drummer, you need to be incredible to have a chance. So the number one thing you can't do is sit around and talk about how you're too busy to practice and how you're too busy to listen to records because you have to be 
somehow, if it's possible, better than anyone who's ever played before, to have a chance to do what you love. And that's why we all do it. We're all crazy because we love it. And it could kick us in the teeth right now, and we're going to be like, man, that really hurt. And then we're going to wake up tomorrow, and we're going to do the same thing because we're, we're stubborn, which is what's allowed us to stay in here. But you know, maybe that's really what love is. Love is intentional stubbornness. And we love the music, and so as we see it evolve and we see it change and we have to recalibrate how we could possibly make a living uh, to keep a roof over our heads and you know to live just a decent middle-class life, we're going to have to have a holistic view of our career, and we need to stop complaining about it, as I'm guilty of doing, and we just need to figure out how we can make it work today, and good things will happen. So you young people, let this be a well, lesson to you, just like my father. Too. Yeah, Jesus, do you have any questions you want to say, ask or say or anything? What is um, do you play? What do you play? I'm a pianist. Oh, uh, and actually I just uh, released self released an album uh, a month ago now. So it, it has been a huge learning experience and, and this is kind of like what I wanted to to hear, you know, just listening to you guys talking about this, uh, you know, a couple of years ahead of me in your career and like all the wonderful things you've done. Oh, this is exactly what I came for. Just hearing your experience. Did you, did you rec uh, record standards that you paid ro uh, royalties on, or did you record originals? It was half originals, half um, the standards. So yeah, I had to go through the whole royalty thing. Yeah, uh, also printing some CDs, the whole CD Baby digital distribution, sending yeah. out things to reviews. Uh, right, and, right. Yeah, so hearing you just talk about it, it's great. This is all I, I want to thank you. Well, I used to teach music business over there. U of I, and uh, I, I think when I left, they haven't put the class back in yet, but it was a really good class, I think. Yeah, and then as Stockton was saying, sir, you're totally right. Like uh, I've taken one music business class in my life, but it's the best class I've taken. You know, I really learned uh, the important things about it. Unfortunately, yeah. it was towards the end of the degree. It should be the first thing in the degree. Like, hey, this is where you're going into. Well, yeah, but then in four more years, it's all outdated by the time you graduate. So. <laughs> Actually, it, it's true. You know, I, I taught a music business class at North Texas for about six years uh, as just an adjunct position, and then they hired a full-time person and fired me, as universities like to do. <laughs> but uh, I found it exhausting teaching that class because I was having to update the information constantly. And I even remember twice calling um, the copyright office because the definition of what is able to be copyrighted as a musical composition is still something that's legally in flux. And right now, the last I checked, it is up to the person who processes your copyright request <laughs> if your song is original. So I want you to think about, at the copyright office, who do you think, what, what clerk is probably getting the gig of processing song applications? Jazz songs, even. I'm sure they do not have a DMA. Oh, that sounds like a cannonball tune. I can't give you credit. <laughs> you know, the things that um, that Stockton and Jesus were saying, it, it makes me think for, for people who watch this later, you know, since we have this collection of people here, you know, we've mostly been talking about self-producing things, but Jay's mentioned, for example, you know, playing on Steeple Chase. Now, Glenn and I know at least one place where, yes, you can get a, a so-called Mid, mid, you know, mid-sized label to put out your recording, but you're paying them. You know, you you have to buy. There are different subterfuges. You have to buy a certain number of product or or whatever. But basically, you, you pay them. In in book publishing, by the way, this would be called a vanity publisher, a vanity press, which has no prestige in book publishing. But in in the jazz world, we're talking about like a really highly respected label that one. But but uh, Jay, I'm wondering like in the steeplechase, it's Nils Winter, right? So, so is, I mean, is this someone who's sort of independently wealthy and doing this as a hobby? Or is he, is he have so much backlist that he somehow, you know, how, how do you think the whole business thing works with him? Can he pay you anything? I have to ask him that. You know, I've known this guy, if, you know, <laughs> I, I call it, I call it cheaple stays. Um, <laughs> But you know what? He's he's been putting out records for fifty years. I'm a bass player, right? So he's Danish. So Nils Henning Orsted Pedersen was on a bunch of Steeplechase records that I bought when I was growing up. So mm -hmm. you know, uh, Kenny Drew, Tete Monsalio, uh, Lee Konitz, Red Mitchell, Dexter. Uh, yeah, Dexter, right? 
And, uh, you know, I used to listen to those records. And then uh, I, I, I did a record with Red Rodney with him for, I guess it was 30 years ago. And I got into a, <laughs> he put out the record. I have that and, record. It's a great record. Great. Really? You're the, you're the one. And, you know, like a year later, he put out another record from that, that it was a live gig. And this was before the internet and stuff. And I sent him a letter. I said, hey, man, you can't just put out a, a, another record. And we went back and forth and back and forth. And to his credit, he ultimately said, you know what? You're right. I'm going to pay you. So he sent me and Gary Dial and John Riley and Dick Oates and Red each, I think, 500 bucks for me to distribute amongst everybody. And he pays even less now. You know, and I'm not proud to say it. But I know to answer your question, Roar, he loves the music. He is passionate about the music. He puts it out. He's cheap, but he does have a big catalog. He has his own CD manufacturing plant. He also has like a label for uh, younger people. He has a classical music label. I have no idea. I've never been to his pad. He always tells, oh, when you're in uh, uh, Copenhagen, come over. I never have. Um, I, but I, th I think Harold has been there, but I know he lives well. I know he used to fly to Concord with his wife, to, you know, to New York, and he would record ten records or CDs in about five days, and then he'd fly back. And is that right? Not at all. But you know, it jazz. You know, Wayne. Sh there, there's different strata. You know. And we all represent those strata, you know, and I don't know that any of us has ever, you know, I'm Glenn and I are probably among the oldest here. I'm, I'm 65. You know, I've made money, not great money, but, I, you know, I make as much money as I feel I need to have to have a home and, the, you know, so my wife will divorce me. You know, we have a nice house. It's taken a while to pay off, but it's paid off. I don't need a lot more than that, you know? I'm happy. Um, but I'd, I'd probably make a lot less than a shitty lawyer, you know? And so, uh, and it's just, you know, I look at it like it's all what it is, you know? And um, yeah, I, I agree with everything you're saying, Stockton, but there's this, you know, I, I teach at a university. When we have faculty, I teach at a couple. I actually have to split in a minute because we're having our video uh, viewing party. Uh -huh. um, but when we have faculty meetings, the word jazz isn't even mentioned. You know, it's it's all about put you know put your on your signature of your email, put that you teach here, post it on Facebook. Do you know? Sp you know, I, I I'll, I'll stop in a second, but I teach private lessons there and I run an ensemble there. And those of the, you that do this, and I, you know, I, I, we, I, I come up with a skeleton of a tune, everybody sends me their stuff. I put in, for that one hour I get paid for that week, I probably put in 15 hours. So, you know, it's, everything is askew. What am I gonna do about it? I, I still try to be a better bass player and a better musician and try to pass it on to people that will then pass it on to other people that will then pass it on and who's making money from it. I know nobody's getting rich except, you know, one out of a thousand. Um, but I, I try to, uh, especially um, in, amidst this pandemic, pandemic, to be grateful that I've had the, the honor to play this music for this long. And I, I you know, uh, I don't know if I was 20, if I would feel that way. Sorry, sorry, Jesus, you know, but I, I would still say, man, focus on the music and work on it. And, you know, I can look at you and tell you're a good musician, you know, and it's worth pursuing, even if you're not going to get rich at it, as Stockton suggests, maybe, you know, there's nothing wrong with working on the business of music too, but you got to put the music first and they have to complement each other, you know. So I'm sorry, Rory, I probably didn't answer your question about steeplechase, but. No, that, that was great. By the way, do you, do you think, I don't even know, I haven't followed steeplechase that much for some years. Is steeplechase occasionally signing a new young artist? 
Yeah, he has a he has a, a, a another label, and in fact, he asked me to do a record. We we did it two months ago in a recording studio with Gary Versace and uh, can't remember who the drummer was right now, but um, a, a student who he heard on a Ron McClure record that he dug. And uh, I think the deal is probably like what you're describing. You know, he gets paid in product. And, and you know, I've known Mills long enough where I say, you got to pay me something, man. You know, and he does. Not great, you know, but I need to play and I want to make music. And um, so, he, yeah, he signs younger people. That's the nice thing about him. You know, he, he had, I did a killing record with Gary Versace that came out a few months ago. And it's one of the, some of the, you know, I met, I played on Paul Blay records because of Mill Winter. You know, so um, I'm, I'm grateful. And, uh, you know, like I said before, we all have our own path in music and our own story to tell everybody on earth, you know, that we know, you know, just watching the shit going on around the world, everybody's got their own story to tell. We get to tell it through music, you know, so I try to stay positive and, you know, put in those 15 hours per hour I get paid. And uh, uh, I, I find it rewarding. <laughs> you know, I say that now then I'll go piss and moan to my wife. But, you know, we are very lucky to play music, you know, so that's the bottom line. Yep, you're right. All right, get the fuck out. <laughs> okay. so, we can complain. I mean, that's one of what, what we do best, you know, that's my forte. All right, Jay, have a good evening. All right. Thank you all. I enjoyed uh, meeting you all and listening to your words and uh, stay healthy and safe. Yeah. Keep doing it, man. Thank you, Glenn. All right. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Well, we can wrap it up uh, unless anybody has a question or some other comment they want to make. I did have a a point. Um, I've noticed that uh, Dave Stryker last maybe three four cds yeah. have been yeah. self-produced on his label yep. and he his business partner has been a promoter a well-known promoter and his cds have charted high on the jazz radio chart now i don't know if that translates into record sales but i do know that it translates into airplay so for whatever that's worth yeah, yeah. Dave's an interesting cat because, of course, he plays guitar, which is an instrument that a lot of people identify with that aren't even into jazz. But those last couple of records, eight track this and eight track that, and he's done a lot of Motown tunes, and it's been interesting to see what he's doing. Um, you know, as far as radio promotion, there really isn't any anymore. I don't think. Uh, I people call and say, "Oh, I can promote your record to so all the radio stations." Well, this one plays jazz from midnight to three, one day a week. This one plays jazz every Sunday afternoon. This one plays jazz, you know, so between three hours of jazz on the channel every week, what are the odds that your record is ever going to get heard, you know? And if it does, does it tra- what does it translate into? Somebody, they don't even say who the people are on when I listen to the Sirius XM. It pisses me off. They go, oh, there's a record for... It's like this big trumpet solo. The whole song is a trumpet solo. And they go, there's a record, for a new tune from Christian McBride. And it's like, well, yeah, but who was that guy that played the entire solo in the whole song? Don't I get to find out who that is? Because I might want to go get that cat, you know? Yeah. It's ridiculous. So it's like, like uh, I think it's like Jim Igo. And Jim then Igo's I think all they, right, yeah. yeah. And I, I think they still send physical copies of CDs to yeah. The radio radio cool. doesn't even most of the radio stations don't even want cds anymore they just stream everything yeah well i was wondering about that too is it if if yeah. you self-release now how do you get you gotta them get to- on some kind of streaming channel that they subscribe to and you know what's even more messed up don't. That? they go on this website and they go they go on the software and they go 10 to 11 a.m easy listening People are in the office, blah, blah. And they check like six check boxes and they hit a button and it gives them a whole playlist of what they should play in those jazz tunes that day. Yeah. So it's just rare that anybody who's really concerned with the music will actually listen to it. 
Yeah, in the old days, we had all those disc jockeys. We could call those people. Remember Rory, Eric Jackson, and some of those people? He's still going, but you could actually call the disc jockey and send them a record, and they would listen to it and play it. Nobody has any control over that anymore. All the shows are syndicated now. So if you get well, on the one that is syndicated. Like, there's still like a, a public radio station to still have. Like here in D.C., we have WPFW, right. WBGO in Newark, New Jersey. They still have air. Yeah, BTO, they're like the big behemoth. You know, they're the only one left. The one yeah, I drove in California through. closed, right? The one in Philadelphia doesn't have jazz anymore. Is K Jazz still um no upping? I no? think it went out, yeah. Wow. WRTI in Philadelphia is gone. Uh, wow. Boston, B U R, they're still going with Eric Jackson up there. There's a couple stations left, but most of them, like you said, are NPR stations that might have jazz a certain amount of time a week or whatever. Yeah. You know, if anybody wants a list, I have a list of all the radio people. But the thing is, you got to recheck them every time you do it because those people are gone now and it's another person volunteering on mm -hmm. jazz at midnight on Hoppin' Harry, you know, or whatever it is. Yeah. Leapin' Larry. <laughs> no, that's Seinfeld. I learned a lot. Thanks. I, I'm looking forward to tomorrow. Yeah, thanks for hanging out. Come back tomorrow. We got a whole bunch of stuff tomorrow going on.